Hello! Welcome to the special lecture on parental investment theory, which uh, I think we can understand as predicting status competition, but it predicts a whole lot more. And I think it gives you a real insight into the power of evolutionary theory to explain things. Okay, we'll get into more details as we go, but I just want you to recognize that if you've got a woman, man, and their behaviors are to some extent at least guided by the genes and the men and women face fundamentally different challenges and opportunities in trying to get their genetic makeup into the next generation and that will cause a slew of differences in behaviors between men and women so goes the theory okay so the overview is that Behaviors evolve, so just like traits, um, height and weight and intelligence and all that, uh, traits um, evolve, behaviors evolve. So males and females can evolve different behaviors. So what's going on with the schematics over here? So we've got a woman, and she's trying to pass her genetic material on to the next generation. Or another way of thinking about it, is the genetic material is trying to use the woman to get to the next generation. And the woman is playing a game where she just has a few chances to get her genes to the next generation. So she's going to put a lot of energy into making sure that that happens. She's heavily invested in each potential offspring. So she's got a lot of heavy lifting to do. The man, on the other hand, is potentially playing a different game in that he has the key that the woman needs to unlock her genetic potential, so to speak. But once the key is provided, if he disappears, the woman is still very much invested in getting the offspring into the next generation. In other words, getting the offspring to survive so that that offspring can have children and then produce more of that genetic material. So that's the fundamental difference. So. Males and females play different games, and they have different strategies. So females must invest in the offspring. They have what's called an obligatory investment. That's a key term, that obligatory investment. In fact, let's circle that term. That's because her offspring chances are so few in other words it takes her so much energy to get a child to be viable that she has to be really careful and invest a lot in each child males have a slightly different setup in that they have an optional investment they might invest heavily in some of these children or in their partner but they might not and the woman will still be obliged to make a substantial investment so this has implications for all kinds of things. How we think about beauty, how we strive for status, um, the fact that males tend to have more of a tendency to try to find variety in mates, etc. Okay, so let's dig into this a little bit more. We have some um, some differences. So we might have we might find that whoops, that's not what I want. We might find that men are more likely to engage in fights and women are more likely to engage in childcare. We can say that that's caused by culture, but let's at least consider the fact that some of that might be driven by the different reproductive challenges that males and females face. Okay, so there are different selective pressures and different affordances that males and females face. So selective pressure is just something that makes it so some genes get into the next generation and some don't. Um, there's some kind of selection going on. And then affordances are certain, certain things in the environment, certain opportunities that might help you get genes into the next generation. So I think of this as like, there's certain constraints or certain things you gotta get around and then there's certain opportunities, certain positive things. So if we got a filter here, some genes are going to be able to get to the next generation and some genes aren't. Okay, so just examples of selective pressures. It's In the ancestral environment, it was really hard to keep a baby alive, to make sure that that baby could get enough food, not get eaten by some kind of tiger, 
get old enough where that baby can have babies and pass on those genes. Another selective pressure, just a, a fact of life here, is that there's more male desire than females can accommodate. So we'll see males and females adopting different strategies to, to, uh, to deal with that. And then an example of an affordance is um, females can be stolen from other men or other groups. So one way we can think about mating, right, is males and females choosing each other. But it could be in the ancestral environment that sometimes there was uh, violence or other means used to get access to women. Okay, so there's things going on in the evolutionary environment. So we know in general that physical traits evolve, how tall somebody is, how big your nose is, uh, how many digits you have. But there's also sex linked tra traits that evolve. So just at the most basic level, males and females have different sexual organs. And so we might think then that there's certain sex linked behaviors that evolved where males and females have different uh, reproductive strategies. All right, time out just for an aside. So what we're doing here is trying to think about in general, if there's certain kinds of behaviors that might be linked to males and females. That does not mean that there not, might not be a subset of people that experience gender differently, that experience gender on a continuum, or that see themselves as having a little bit of both genders, or see themselves as, as asexual or non-binary or trans. There's all kinds of options that are out there. And this logic is not dismissing any of that, but it's just looking at, if we look at where there are big general trends in terms of how the sexes behave. But we gotta recognize there's many deviations from that. And we as a modern liberal kind of society, we celebrate that and we want people to, to find their own fulfillment. So none of this is trying to suggest that this is the way things should be. It's just trying to explain uh, the way things might have been working in the ancestral environment. Okay. All right, so now we have some, there's selection for these sex linked behaviors. So the basic argument is that males and females have different hardware, right? Males have testes outside their body. Women have a womb inside their body, etc. cetera. Um, so we might think about some things that we tend to observe and see if we can explain them with parental investment theory. All right, so we might say that across cultures, women tend to show a preference for men of higher status. That may vary some by culture, but in general, females, for example, marry males that are a few years older than they are. Not a lot, but a little bit, because they might, by that point, have acquired more resources, the logic would suggest. Males, uh, in contrast, have maybe a greater attunement to physical beauty so if you just stop for a second and think, um, females that are attracted to status may have more access to resources, which they can use to raise their offspring. Males that are attracted to females that are fertile might have more offspring. It could be that some males were attracted to women in their 80s. Odds are they didn't have a lot of children. Okay, so reviewing some basic logic, genes guide behavior. If genes get passed on, that behavior is passed on. So there's certain what we call adaptive behaviors. That doesn't mean they're good or bad. That just means that they tend to increase reproductive fitness. If you have those behaviors, you tend to have more or better offspring. Adaptive behavior means that the genes are guiding the behavior, the genes that are guiding that behavior increase in frequency. So in other words, successful strategies tend to pass on more of their genes. Genes promoting not adaptive behaviors decrease in frequency. So those men that are attracted to women that are in their 80s might have had a lot of great relationships, but probably didn't have a lot of babies, probably didn't pass on a lot of genes. Okay, so we get these feedback loops where women that are attracted to high status males will get more resources and that will have them have more reproductive success 
And so that gene of being attracted to high status males will get passed on. Same way with males. Those males that tend to be attracted to females that are fertile, in other words, um, be so-called beautiful women are going to have more offspring and that's going to pass on the gene that drives males to be interested in markers of fertility. Okay, so coming back to parental investment theory to just lay it out as simply as we can. So in 1972, um, Trivers, um, an evolutionist, uh, biologist, um, actually was watching pigeons outside his window and he started thinking about it and it eventually led him to this theory. But the, the short story is you want to think about genes as wanting to get themselves into future generations. And Trivers realized that males and female genes males carrying genes and females carrying genes, those genes in the males and females face different challenges and opportunities. Okay, so let's talk about the female game. The crucial thing about the female game is you can only have so many children. You only have so many chances. One limitation, you only have so many eggs. Another limitation, you only can carry so many pregnancies to term because it takes a long time. It takes almost a year, nine months, right, to bring a baby to term and then you got to feed the baby and whatever and you're not gonna be ready to have another baby anytime soon so this might be a little of a stretch but let's just imagine for the sake of our argument that you imagine the average woman can maybe have five chances of having a, a kid make it into the next generation okay so women could have only few offspring so therefore they got to be hugely invested in each one and in the ancestral environment, they're going to need assistance because there's no dishwashers, there's no daycare, there's no government subsidies. You are on your own. And if you die, your kid dies. So it would help to have some resources. So they're going to tend to be choosier and prefer those males that are well-resourced or high status. All right, the male game is different. The male game you have an almost infinite supply of sperm. And in theory, if you could find available partners, you can have almost an infinite number of offspring. Maybe not infinite, but you know, I don't know, two or 3,000. So here the investment is negotiable. The man needs to get access to the woman's offspring capacity. But once he has um, impregnated a woman, the woman at that point is going to still be very invested because she only has so many chances. So at that point, if the man disappears, he can still pretty much count on the woman being invested in that child. So again, it's that obligatory investment, obligatory, um, that women have, whereas men um, have more discretion. So behaviors, you're potentially less choosy, um, but you're going to be driven by fertility markers and for reasons we'll explain in a second, you might be more risk prone and aggressive. It might pay off more for men to behave like that. Okay, so some more here from a game theory perspective. Okay, so if um, females have a very limited number of chances, they will be willing to do a lot of heavy work to get that kid into the next generation. Most women would love to have an invested partner that stays with them and helps them with getting enough calories that they can nurse, finding food for the, the woman and the baby, shelter, education, things to make the baby have a higher status and better social network, all that kind of stuff. So option one is the male invests. Option two, oh, I should say here. So these things are just me meant to represent that there's a lot of challenges in the ancestral environment, and even now, to get a kid to the point where they can have their own kids. In other words, to get those genes into the next generation. You might have a lot of kids die, or never find a partner, or uh, become ill, um, etc. Option two, the male provides the key so to speak, to unlock the egg, but then the male disappears. 
the male might die, the male might find another woman, the male might go off in some kind of adventure as males are inclined to do. So the woman can still get the kid to um, have kids. You can still get those genes to the next generation, but I've drawn the arrow here as skinnier because it's a little bit harder. She doesn't have as much oomph as if the male invests. Okay, so what are some of the takeaways? Once a female has a child, there's strong incentives to persist. So there's that obligatory investment. Once a male has a child, the male can skip town and the woman will carry on. Now, there's many males that are going to choose to invest. That's not, that's not um, in dispute. But there's this other option available. So the female, as a consequence, is really motivated to find reliable males that have resources, ones that won't skip town. But it turns out that the number of reliable males that have a lot of resources, those are kind of small. So there's some competition for those kind of males. The male is motivated to find a fertile female because he's not fertile. So he's really got to focus on fertility um, first and foremost by this logic. Okay, so if all that makes sense, then we can derive some dynamics that occur because of that. And it's this is basic um, what I would call like game theory in that if you just think about when you're playing a certain game, um, there's certain um, things that tend to evolve out of it. So if O has two circles lined up ready to get a third one and win, Blue's move is forced. Blue has to go there. And so the dynamics of tic-tac-toe don't emerge necessarily because blue has a certain characteristic and red has a certain characteristic. It's the characteristics of the game that come to, to shape what's going on. And so I would argue that you can think about these six things as having something to do with um, parental investment theory. So we're going to work through those now. Okay, so... Males tend to be in competition for female fertility. Okay, so if you just work through the logic, males are going to, those males that tend to be attracted to really young kids, gosh, I can't get this thing to work right. Males that tend to be attracted to really young kids, they probably didn't pass on a lot of genes because really young kids aren't fertile. Uh, males that are attracted to women in their 80s probably didn't pass on a lot of genes. But women, sorry, but men that had a tendency to be attracted to women, say, in their early 20s, late teens, early 20s, they are likely to have passed on more kids. Now, just to remind you of the dynamics here, there's a lot of males that would be interested, that have extra sperm that would be interested in that's fertile female. And it could be that some of these males already have a partner. And it could be that some of these males have a lot of partners, but they don't, but they'd like to have one more. So it doesn't necessarily stand that it's just males that don't have partners that are attracted to the attractive female because their investment can be so low. There can be a lot of competition for that fertile female. Okay. So what comes out, men are going to prefer beautiful women. That is women that are fertile. That is going to vary somewhat by culture. Some cultures might prefer women that are slightly heavier, some that are slightly thinner. But in general, there's going to be certain markers like good skin, youthful eyes, thick lips, things that suggest you're in your early 20s are going to be attractive to most men. Okay, but there's also a limited supply of, of female chances. Remember, the women have just a few chances right? And the men have all this excess capacity. So that's going to drive some conflict. So there's a near infinite supply of these keys that can unlock the reproductive potential. So what's going to happen? Men are going to compete over women. All right. But women have something to say about this too. So other things being equal, women are going to prefer reliable, well-resourced men, right? So it stands to reason that women are going to find men that sit on the top of status hierarchies or have a lot of resources. They're going to find them attractive because remember women have to do this heavy lift to get their genes into the next generation. So if they get some help, they're going to really like that. Now they still might be attracted to um, somebody lower on the totem pole, 
But other things being equal, this is pretty attractive. So I don't think it's an accident that many young girls are f fantasize about being a princess, somebody that would be of the kind of stock, so to speak, that a king would consider marrying, a high resource male would consider marrying. So takeaways, women are gonna prefer men of higher status with more resources. So therefore, um, and women need those resources. Uh, they would also prefer to have high status sons, sons that have better access to resources. So some of the implications here is lower status men might get shut out. And there might be some intense competition, even violence, trying to get access to female. So to set up the next point, I'm just going to ask you to think about why uh, men might be more inclined to take advantage of opportunistic mating situations. Um, so we just have a little scenario here from a, the old show Friends. Um, two characters, they're like, have a very specific purpose. They're supposed to be looking for this escaped monkey. I don't know why, but um, they get distracted along the way. Marcel, Marcel, Marcel. Hi, can I help you? Uh, we're kind of having an emergency and we, <clears throat> we were looking for something. <laughs> A monkey. Yes, have you seen any? No. No, I haven't seen a monkey. Do you know anything about fixing radiators? Sure, sure. Did you, uh, did you try turning the knob back the other way? <laughs> of course. Oh, then, no. <laughs> Taste this daiquiri. Is there too much rum in here? Just a second. <laughs> Hope you find your monkey. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait. Um, we may not know anything about radiators per se, but we do have a certain amount of expertise in the heating and cooling milieu. <laughs> uh, aren't we kind of in the middle of something here? Oh, yes, but these women are very hot and they need our help. <laughs> and they're very hot. <laughs> we can't, all right? Uh, we're sorry. You no idea how sorry but we promised we'd find this monkey if you see him he's about yay high and answers to the name marcel so if we could get some pictures of you you'd really be helping us out <laughs> okay from now on you don't get to talk to other people <laughs> marcel marcel okay so um, you might say that's stereotypical, and I, I would give that, but one takeaway is two males were fairly interested in some kind of opportunistic short-term mating opportunity, and once the females kind of were down to that, they're like, nah, I don't think we're interested. I would suggest that that can also be uh, potentially explained by the parental investment theory. Okay, so males... Um, can be understood as um, being in a certain kind of relationship, but they still might, um, given the dynamics of the game that they have to play, um, have evolved the tendency to keep their options open. So we can think about men, um, even if they're with somebody, they can find other women attractive and um, ex ex imagine at least exploring other possibilities. What I want you to think about is that it's, you can see it as men, but really it's the gene that's interested in these reproductive fitness resources. And that's what's driving things. And the evolved tendency of men to be interested in women um, seeking a variety of mates um, is really potentially traceable to this logic of the genetic potential. So when the, the male is seeing this genetic potential, they might be interested in, oh, I just find lots of women attractive. Well, the gene is saying, hey, each one of these women offers me an opportunity to get into the next generation because these women have this really sought after limited resource and women are ready to do this kind of heavy lifting. And so this discrepancy between what males and females bring to the table can potentially explain this, this variety seeking.
Okay, so men attracted to multiple women likely had more offspring. So you can imagine affairs, harems, kind of serial monogamy, where a man is with a woman for a while, then he gets divorced and he's with another woman, or conquest or quick encounters, but that could it could take on a lot of different forms. So the basic logic is opportunistic mating uh, is where men are trying to recruit multiple women to get their genes into the next generation. Now, does this mean that some men never have affairs or serial, any of this stuff? Sure. Does it mean that there might be reasons in certain situations where women would seek variety and seek to get input from the genetic material of different males? Yes. But other things being equal, you'd expect women to gain a lot less from this because they have a pretty limited supply. And so trying to get these into the next generation, there's only so many men that they're interested in. Whereas for men, again, if you have an infinite amount of um, genetic material in terms of sperm, then it kind of opens up a wider field of interest. Okay. So we can also think about differences in risk taking. So imagine that we have a gene that, uh, this is a little bit oversimplified, but a gene that uh, is inclined to promote different kinds of risk taking. So let's imagine that this gene causes risky behaviors that leads to, in most cases, early death, and that gene doesn't get passed on. But think about this. Even if most of its carriers die young without passing on any genetic information, if one carrier of the gene gets fairly lucky and is able to have a relationship with a number of women, that can be good enough to get that gene passed on to the future. So even like just logic here, you got six copies of the gene. If one guy has multiple relationships, say he becomes a ruler of some kingdom or whatever and has a harem, but he's able to pass on a lot of that. So it can turn out that risk taking um, is something that can pay off for men, um, even if it only works occasionally, but this is not true for women. Remember, women have just a few chances to get their offspring into the next generation. And if women die, if for whatever reason, their offspring are likely gonna die too, because it without the woman to take care of them, it's unlikely they're gonna get um, survive into the next generation. So in general, we'd expect women to be less likely to get into bar fights and other kinds of violent altercations. Okay. Related to this is a specific kind of risk taking related to fighting. So across different kinds of species, you'll see males fighting. Um, and they're oftentimes fighting for access to females. So here we have some rams. You gotta love the post hit. They just kind of look at each other like, yeah, that was, oh, that was good. Okay, so you might look at that and go, guys, guys, can't we all get along? But there might be some logic to why there's this conflict. So, and it might even be tied to um, why males go through per puberty. So every year, male elk grow these huge antlers um, that are used in these competitions, um, I think they're called ruts, um, where they are trying to um, best other males to get access to females. And one way of understanding male puberty is you're getting the musculature, the height, the deeper voice from the larger chest, all things that make you better able to compete in a physical way for potential mates. Okay, so what's the logic? You've got um, males that are all interested in a limited supply of females. So if males are able to kill off the competition, that leaves more opportunity for them, or even just outcompete the, the um, other males, then they get access to the women's reproductive resources. So there's the logic is you can eliminate competition. Um, you can also imagine that you're showing your ability to defend the female, right? Because the female knows that if other males are potentially um, aggressive risks, um, 
in certain situations, she might want to be with a male that is formidable so that the male can defend her. But the short logic is aggression can help secure access to eggs. Okay, and again, remember the logic we explored in the previous slide that even if most of the time that, that male aggression leads to death, um, if it pays off once in a while, especially if it pays off big, like you become a high status um, warlord or whatever, you then have access to more females and then you can send off many copies of that aggressive gene into future generations. So there's plenty of evidence that certain individuals like Genghis Khan um, conquered um, enough other peoples and uh, took their women that he passed on a ton of genetic material through multiple, multiple numbers of other women. So even if aggressive gene usually causes early death, it can still pay out just because of this leveraging effect of if the male gets enough resources, he can have access to a lot of women and you have a, a different kind of ball game. Okay, but also consider this more mundane example. Um, if the male is taking different kinds of risks, but risks that oftentimes produce more resources for his partner, even if that male dies, the female, uh, having already mated with the, the male and having his children, can still push those genes into the next generation. Uh, so it's that, remember, it's that obligatory investment. So women are going to be a lot more risk averse, whereas men, because their genes can be carried by somebody else, so to speak, um, can still engage in some risky, aggressive behavior. But that logic, again, is different for women because if women die, then their offspring die. Okay, and then a little darker subject. You can imagine, and we're speculating some here, but you can imagine some of this basic parental investment logic uh, helping to explain why we see war. Um, Okay, so even if you go back to the Bible, um, you'll see um, in Scripture um, discussions about how to the um, Israelites that, um, you know, if the, if the Lord gives you victory over your enemies and you see beautiful women and you fall in love with them, you can take them as your wife. Uh, and there's not necessarily here a restriction that it's um, only one. So another way of thinking about that is um, that many conflicts can be explained from a genetic standpoint as um, men being motivated in part, at least subconsciously, by um, access to other women. So um, this guy, Jonathan um, Gottschall, has written about how many of the um, Homer's epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, can be understood as men fighting over women. And then uh, you can also look at situations where there's evidence that there's a lot of sexual coercion that goes along with war. So this is a study of what happened to German women at the end of the Second World War. So the so-called good guys, the French, English, um, Americans, and Russian that occupied Germany, there's evidence that a lot of women were coerced um, into sex, were um, raped, and that that produced a lot of offspring. And I just I point this book out in particular because this is a situation where, by and large, the allies were seen as, quote, the good guys. And so the fact that there's still evidence that a lot of that coercion occurred is notable. So the good news is that humans are fantastic cooperators. We tend to be very good at, at um, helping each other, but that can be used for war. Um, and that kind of cooperation can be used to leverage um, access to other females. Okay, so what's the basic logic? Um, your coalition um, gets in a conflict with another coalition. Ideally, your coalition is a little bit bigger such that you can um, wipe out the other coalition. And you can imagine in the ancestral environment, there's not prisoners of war, just defeated men are put to the sword. So that means that all those female resources, um, speaking just logically, um, are acquired, so to speak, by um, the victorious coalition. 
So again, this is this is dark stuff, and we're in no way saying that this is the way things should work, but it's possible that this is what drove some of the violence uh, in our ancestral condition and even some of the um, the tragic consequences of war that we see today. Okay, so takeaways. Men um, can aggress as coalitions. So because we have language and means of communication that males can form up groups with can form coalitions with other males to achieve their ends it's likely the case that larger coalitions are more formidable so this might explain have something to do with the tendency for many societies at least to engage in war and it might help explain why you had the emergence of states or uh, organizations where you could have a structured army that was able to secure resources um, and then remember that war brings about a lot of death for sure, but if there's enough reproductive success, at least for some people carrying the aggressive gene, that it can still pay out. All right, so that is the end. I will just, um, oops, sorry, sorry, I forgot the last step here. My little diagram was the genes getting passed on through the women to the next generation. Okay. So just the main takeaway here is that parental investment theory can potentially explain a lot of different um, um, ways that males and females different behaviors. But one thing I would have you think about in particular from an evolutionary standpoint is the competition for access to resources can explain a lot that has to do with um, the overconsumption we see and the um, overuse, overharvesting um, greed that drives the depletion of the natural environment. We can trace some of that back to this competition for status because of the access it gave to, to females and also for females preferring higher status men. Okay. Thank you for listening.